Hello everyone, and welcome back to PokePaint, the series where I draw new Pokemon to inhabit my fan-made Pokemon region based on Florida, the Gladios region. Now, last time, if you remember, I drew a map for the Gladios region to show a more concrete idea of what I imagined a Florida-inspired region would look like. And originally, I wanted to dive right into drawing the player characters and then the first gym leader next. Uh, but since that would probably entail a few videos without very many new Pokemon, I wanted to chop up the gap in new Fakemon content to give you some new designs before I dive into more concretely designing this world. One of the less connected ideas from the series that I had that was still nonetheless based in Gladios was my idea of creating cross-generation evolution Pokemon for a few evolutionary lines that I feel need them. As many of you know, the first few cross-generation evolution Pokemon appeared in Generation 2, with new evolved forms of previously two or single-stage Pokemon, uh, or in a few cases, branched evolutions for full lines. Uh, these new Pokemon served to more fully explore the ideas posed in the original evolution line that may have not developed as far as they should have, or in some cases, to bring back ideas that were originally intended to be incorporated but had to be cut for behind the scenes restrictions. Thankfully, this really neat form of new Pokemon was kept around in the coming generations, where in Generation 4 we got a bunch of evolutions and pre-evolutions to existing Pokemon, and though the introduction of new evolutions would slow the modern generations, it was thankfully brought back with Generation 9, breathing new life into a group of Pokemon that had uh, its last true additions in the mid-2000s. These cross-gen evolutions, though honestly quite a novel concept and possibly an unnecessary one, uh, do have a few tangible bene benefits, including the ability to buff weaker Pokemon without changing pre-existing lore too much, or more importantly in my case, seemingly finish an evolutionary arc that may have seemed unfinished or unsatisfactory prior to the new Pokemon existing. Choosing Pokemon to receive evolutions for the Gladius region seemed like a daunting task, as especially with the newest bout of evolutions, uh, they seemingly filled in the holes of what I originally wanted to explore. But as I looked into it, I eventually found some Pokemon that, given a little thought, I decided were in dire need of evolutions. Of the lines I chose, all looked like they could be appropriate middle stages in the way that they didn't appear to be too completed or mature, as it were. It is important that a middle stage feel like a transition period from point A to B, and so that the final stage isn't overshadowed by the middle. For the same reasons, it's also important that the final form looks like an obvious next step, and not a branched evolution. In other words, the new final form should look like a step above in some way. And therefore, it's also important that you choose a Pokemon that has room for growth in the way that certain types of Pokemon have design limitations and the way that the art style does and doesn't allow for certain aesthetics in the final form. The existing Pokemon that I chose to get evolutions follow at least one or more of these ideas uh, and are as follows. Driftblim, as though it looks complete enough, there are obvious places that its design could go. Sunflora, as it's a weaker Pokemon from a previous generation that desperately needs a spark of something new to keep it relevant mechanically and give it more of a fair chance at being liked by the average fan. Quillfish, for a similar reason, although I do have a friend who once joked that Quillfish was his favorite Pokemon, I don't know very many people who unironically like Quillfish, although I did just kind of design this for him as a little inside joke. And finally, Scrafty, as there's a fair few people who like it, and to my understanding, it is it has uh, a solid standing mechanically. However, in the right visual context, you could e it could easily be illustrated as a transitional middle stage. For my evolution for Driftblim, there was an obvious third step to take the design. Each stage has, of course, a reference to balloons, and even a smaller reference to transportation. With Driftblim being designed after hot air balloons and Drifloon being described as transporting people in a more uh, nefarious way. It seems like a no-brainer to base the third form off of a bigger transportation balloon, a blimp. Transposing most of Drifblim's design motifs into a blimp shape was actually quite easy, and the cloud tuft on each of the original stage's heads 
served as not only a fun accent piece for this hop, but also as a stand-in for where the passenger carriage would be on a real blimp on the bottom. In cross-generation evolutions of the past, the new introduction of a previously non-existing Pokemon was explained away with a new, usually overly specific evolution method, with many generations posing to introduce a new item or use an old, previously uh, unused or unimportant item, uh, sometimes with a specific trading or level up method to try and explain away why you wouldn't have come across this evolution in the past. Although my method for Drift Blim sort of doesn't work for the prior mentioned ideas above, as this item was readily available in its premiere game, I still felt like the Dusk Stone was thematically appropriate enough for this mon. Its name, Dreplin, is a portmanteau of Drift from the original naming convention and Zeppelin, a type of German airship. You'll notice in the Pokedex I included the map of where these mons can be found, as I've included every previously existing Gladius Pokemon since I made the map. But I wanted to clarify with these cross-gen evolutions specifically, uh, that the marked places are where the first form can be found, as I feel like being able to find a new evolution in the wild in its premier generation kind of defeats the purpose of introducing a new evolution method to an existing Pokemon. As I feel like cross-gen evolutions are less of a new Pokemon and more of a novel way to interact with an old Pokemon. So I feel like this use of the map would be more appropriate in this situation. Uh, so that stands for the rest of the mons in this video as well. Dreplin, the blimp Pokemon, and the evolved form of Driftblim. Very occasionally, a Driftblim will evolve into a Dreplin when they come into contact with the Dusk Stone. This evolution, though once thought to have only been a legend, is gaining popularity with trainers in the Gladios region, especially with those who travel for work or pleasure. A travel industry employing Dreplin and their trainers has popped up in the last half century, and the international airport in Renetro City has almost entirely shifted away from airplanes in favor of this cheaper alternative. If you encounter a Dreplin at an airport outside of Gladios, chances are that it is coming from or returning to its home region soon. A Pokemon that I hear about needing a new evolution a lot is Sunflora, and honestly it's not too hard to see why. Being based on a Sunflower, there are a lot of cool places this Mon could go, and in the way that Sunkern is designed, at least in my opinion, this would lead you to believe that its evolution would look pretty unique, just to have it evolve into a bland, uninspired design with middling stats. Doing a Sunflower Pokemon for a region where farms and farm life would be a staple theme, at least in the early game, seemed like a perfect excuse to touch on a Sunflower Pokemon. For this evolution, I went on a different path than I had originally intended, and leaned hard into the weird side of its design. An idea that I had heard in other Sunflora Fakemon evolutions was to make it a dual grass and fire type, to lean into the sun side of the Sunflower design, and I thought that would be a really good concept to carry over into my evolution. The idea behind the type was that this stage would lean hard into the absorbing the sun part of its inspiration. I added two additional Sunflora-like heads, adding to the weird factor of the design, and to add to the solar power idea, as I imagine as it got more powerful and absorbed more energy, the faces on the flowers would perk up and go from sleeping to awake and happy like the main face. This idea served to communicate the flower grove idea that I wanted to come across, as I felt like going from a seed to a single flower to a lush flower garden was a proper direction to go. This was all on top of the fact that the multiple heads subtly jabbed at a certain other underwhelming multi-headed grass and fire Pokemon. Uh, when it came for the evolution method, I originally wanted to use a sunstone, as I felt like that was thematically appropriate. However, finding the information for the Pokedex page, I learned that for some reason you need a sunstone to evolve Sunkern into Sunflora, which honestly just seems like too much for a simple and weak Pokemon. So instead, I went with the more modern type of evolution method in choosing to have it level up once under the field condition strong sunlight. The name Florasola uses the same roots as Sunflora, but in reverse. Like said before, you wouldn't be able to find this evolution in the wild. Rather, Sunkern would be found on Route 2 in the Gress State Ranch, while Sunflora would be found on Route 4. 
Florisola, the sunflower Pokemon and the evolved form of Sunflora. Only in perfect growing conditions will a Sunflora evolve into a Florisola. Using their flower-like petals, they absorb solar energy that they can store and then unleash in the form of powerful fire-type attacks. The demeanor of a Florisola is entirely dependent on the weather, where when the sun is bright and strong, they will be jovial with vibrant petals, and if the sky is overcast, they will become sluggish and irritable. They are popular with farmers as when they shed their petals every few months, they can be harvested and used in popular dishes from the Gladius region. The most common forms of Florisola petal preparation is either grilling them or using them in stews. If prepared properly, they have a taste similar to sweet corn. This next Pokemon, unlike the last, seems at first to have no relation to Florida, as quailfish, based on a pufferfish, are not found in the waters of the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico. This evolution does, however, have a thematic tie into the region in the way that it would be vaguely based on some weaponry and linked to a, to a vaguely military theme tying it into one of the gyms later down the line. Though there is a pre-existing evolution of quillfish from the Legends Arceus games, I felt like my approach was a bit too dissimilar to be a regional form of overquill, and as such, disquill was born. Quill, coming from the misspelling of quill, a spine similar to the spines found on pufferfish, and also coming from the pre-evolved form, and discharge, as this Pokemon would be based on an undersea mine. I gave it some plate armor to help make more apparent its inspiration, however in the hypothetical game world of Gladios, I imagine that the similarities would be far more apparent. Here's why. Like in the Hoenn games, I would want there to be underwater sections to explore under Route 8, 11, and 12, and in those underwater sections, I imagine one of the landscapes would be an underwater minefield, uh, where you would have to navigate carefully to avoid setting off the mines, and hiding amongst them would be Disquill. This would be a rare case of this evolution being actually found in the wild, and though Quillfish would be found on the in the upper levels of the ocean, Disquill would be found in the same locations, but on the ocean floor. Honestly, Disquill has become another favorite Pokemon of mine in the series, as I now can't really see Quillfish as a single stage Pokemon on its own. On top of that, I have the approval of that friend that I talked about earlier, who was the self-proclaimed quillfish lover, as they said that my evolution, quote, goes hard. <laughs> so, to evolve quillfish into disquill, I went with a classic trade holding a metal coat method. This new evolution would also have a new ability called Diffuse, uh, that would basically allow it to use explosion moves like self-destruct without immediately fainting due to recoil. Disquill, the undermined Pokemon, and the evolved form of Quillfish. Disquill are a recently discovered evolution of the Pokemon Quillfish that is difficult to find in the wild as they dwell only in the deepest parts of the ocean. Grouping together in packs, they form what appear to be dense underwater forests by using their chain-like appendages to attach themselves to the sea floor. Their tough exterior is hard as steel, and it conceals a hazardous core of toxic chemical compounds that, if mixed together, will form a violent explosion. If they, come, if they become detached from the bottom of the ocean unexpectedly and rise to the surface, the sudden pressure change can cause them to explode unexpectedly. It is important not to startle a disquill as they have famously explosive tempers. Being vaguely related to Florida in the way that this next Pokemon is based on a lizard, uh, and to be a true Florida region you can never have too many lizards, I thought that Scrafty could easily receive a third evolution, uh, mostly because it honestly looks like a second stage itself. Drawing an evolution seems to be more difficult than I originally imagined, however, as I found it hard to make it read as an evolution and not a branched evolution. Uh, in the end, however, uh, in the way that I made the arms and tail more exaggeratedly bulky in adding more baggy skin to, this bunch, to these bunched up areas, I feel like I did my due diligence in communicating its relationship as a next step in the design. Looking at the color palette, I had an obvious direction that the evolution could take. As Scraggy starts out mostly yellow, going darker to more orange colors with Scrafty, and I thought that the third form should of course go darker 
and get some reds prominently in there. I also further explored the grunge slash punk inspiration of the design and adding some spikes that double as grunge jewelry and lizard spines, as well as adding some clawed toes that mimic the white clean shoes found in many older grunge aesthetics. This last part lent into the idea that each stage would represent a phase of growth. Uh, Scraggy would be the young kid finding the punk aesthetic cool and trying to mimic maybe an older brother in the way that it decided to don baggy pants and model its hair after a mohawk. Scrafty would represent a young teen who finally gets to express itself further with more authentic aesthetic clothes and haircuts. And Scriffraff represents the older teen or young adult who has fully gone into the grunge aesthetic with all the accessories and stuff. The name Scriffraff comes from the combination of scrag, which is an old nurse term that uh, means shriveled up or wrinkled, also being the beginning of both of its first evolution names, and riffraff, slang for an undesired or disreputable group of people, often referring to young people in gangs or groups of ruffians. Um, after some digging, I felt that the Reaper cloth would be the best thing to evolve a Scrafty into a Scriffraff, as it both references the baggy clothes and the semi-morbid aesthetic found in many of these grunge styles. As the only other Pokemon to evolve through this method is the Ghost-type Dusclops. Like before, Scraggy would be found in all of the noted places on the map, and not Scriffraff itself. Scriffraff, the ruffian Pokemon, and the evolved form of Scrafty. Their rubbery skin has accumulated with every shed, and the older a Scriffraff is, the saggier its skin will become. When a Scrafty evolves into a Scriffraff, they will challenge the leader for the top spot, and the loser will be banished from their gang, left to wander the wilds until it returns stronger or happens upon another gang that it can take control of. Their large head crests earned them much respect from the Scraggy and Scrafty in their gangs, and it is because of this that a gang will usually be led by a Scriffraff. They meticulously manicure their crests so that they can remain clean and pristine. So here are the four new cross-generation evolutions for Driftblim, Sunflora, Quillfish, and Scrafty. Dreplin, Florisola, Disquill, and Scriffraff. Uh, do any of these improve the evolutionary lines for you guys? Would you hunt down these existing Pokemon and Gladios just to add them to your team and evolve them later? Let me know in the comments below. As a quick bit of self-promotion before I go, if you have ever wanted to support me in my creation of PokePaint, History of the Future, and my other assortment of art-based projects, and support my goal in making art and YouTube my full-time job, you can support me on Patreon. Through any of the affordable tiers, you can join my other supporting patrons and helping the channel grow by getting to view my videos before they come out officially and other awesome perks in the increasing tiers. And thank you to my existing patrons who continue to support me on my journey. The support means the world. I hope that you all enjoyed this look at another facet of the Gladius region and are excited for the upcoming videos in the series. If you liked this video, then leave a like, and if you want to see more like it, then subscribe and turn on the bell to get notified when I upload next.